Hello everyone, today we're going to talk about the globalization of the English language. So what is a global language? Well, according to David Crystal, it is a language that is recognized around the world to perform official and functional roles within certain communities. It is a large community of speakers combining English as a first language, English as an official language, and or English as a foreign language. That said, David Crystal states that the number of people who speak a language does not necessarily make it a global one. Take Mandolin, for instance, which is the most spoken language in the world, but lacks global language status. So, how did English become a global language? Well, at the height of the British Empire in the 1900s, Queen Victoria had amassed a total of 53 states, one third of the world population speaking English. So you can imagine the number of English variations, or Englishes. As a matter of fact, World Englishes is a term coined by Brash Cuckrew. Due to the wide number of variations, there appears to be no ownership of the English language. However, Brash Cuttrew believes otherwise, as he believes the ownership is still prevalent, and he discusses this in his concentric circles of World Englishes you see below. At the core, are countries like the USA, the UK, Ireland, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, countries with a historical English language background and thus spoken as a first language. In the outer extended circles are countries who have adopted English as a second language for governmental institutions like Singapore, India, Malawi and over 50 other territories. Finally, in the expanding or extending circle, English is neither the first nor the second language rather the language of choice to learn as a foreign language. This includes China, Japan and Greece. It is important to note that currently the number of people speaking English as a first language is outmatched by those speaking it as a second language. So how did English come to Colombia? Well, it came to Colombia through the Caribbean islands of San Andres, Providencia and Santa Catalina, which together make up two variations of English, one called Islander and the other one called Palinquero. The Islander dialect resembles that of Jamaican English, but using phonemic spelling to transliterate utterances. Sadly, though the natives of San Andres are proud of their cult cultural heritage and Islander language, they speak it privately as they are subject to discrimination by people from continental Colombia due to the stark contrast with other more dominant variants of English like American English. And according to Adriana Gonzalez, the local f affirms that they do indeed speak English, not patois, which they believe is a derogatory term. English in present-day Colombia is equally bleak. Despite the growing number of TFL professionals in Colombia, native speakers are still preferred as e even if they have no formal qualifications. Furthermore, despite the effort by the government to improve second language competence in Colombia, English learning is still considered a privilege. Those who can afford costly bilingual schools are more likely to succeed. This discrepancy is what Mejia Mejia refers to as the unabridgeable gap between private and state schools. Globalization and the spread of English. Is English really becoming universal? Is English becoming as universal as often claimed? Well, in 2010 does it. And he says that worldwide globalization is of English is attributed to ESL and EFL, English as second language and foreign language in schools and around the world. Um, it became like this because of USA and Great Britain domination of the economy uh, since three uh, or four centuries ago. And English is used as lingua franca in business nowadays, navigation, science, technology, and, and the academic world. And due to this, what are the pros of how it all started to expand? Well, we have some titles. We have that students went into exchange programs, foreign exchange programs. Um, high demand, there's a high demand for English instructors, especially native speakers. And there is a high need for criteria and norm reference tests, such as TOEFL and IELTS. And finally, family migration to English speaking countries. To expand a little bit more of this, well, this is the we are in the new home and all on the old home. So we're all traveling to have life expectations and better uh, to better off our lives. So there was a high demand back before and there's still high demand for native speakers as English 
for first-hand language interaction. Um, there is an international standardized tests need, which uh, improves the access for tertiary higher education, which is college, university, and above, and also for high professional uh, positions that require English to communicate with others, of course. This is only a small portion. And students exchange programs would improve the competence through complete cultural and English language immersions. And this all started back in the end, at the end of World War II, when the um, United States and Germany started uh, the programs. Then, finally, is the family migration to English to speaking countries, the American dream. Everyone has ever dreamed of improving their life circumstances. And so families think that by doing this, the children can acquire the language faster and have better life opportunities for the new generations. And in the map, we can see that the English speaking countries in Europe where um, over 370 million Europeans can hold a conversation in English. It's, it's, it's pretty good. So what are the cons? The cons are the opportunities for English are used for using the, the English language are only constrained to only urban circles for white collar jobs and a small portion of the job market uses it. People use English only in the academic world and not in everyday lives. So the population of the anglophone area is a minority and it's only associated to the privileged class. And the, therefore, the working class and low class individuals do not have any access to the English globalization. English is not spreading uniformly, therefore, uh, everywhere, because it is mostly in the academic world and the general population does not have access to it. And so the spread of English is constrained to inequities of socioeconomic structure. All of it raises the question if there should be one standard English. If we look at the paradigm of the world Englishes, we can see that one standard English cannot and should not be accepted. It is close to impossible to create it, because everything related to English changes all the time. And that's the reason why educators should be prepared for this transformation. How can they do that? First of all, there should be new courses for the teachers to prepare them for the change and acceptance of diversity. There should be new curricula that raise and promote awareness of the varieties of English. Also, the teachers, and especially the native ones, should understand and come to peace with the fact that they are not in the majority of the English speakers anymore. And that does not mean that non-native speakers are not equipped well enough to speak or teach the language. And at last, the existence of varieties of English doesn't mean that one variety is more correct than the other, as even the age of certain variety does not determine its superiority. All of these changes could mean that English as a foreign language could cease to exist. Gradle claims that in 10-15 years, the number of English learners will decrease, as well as the private sector market for teaching teenagers and young adults. But not only that, also we should be prepared for the speakers of Mandarin and Spanish, who are already challenging English for educational resources and policy attention. We have to remember that Spanish, French, German and Japanese are also growing and who knows, one of them could slowly replace English and become a lingua franca.